What's up guys, Jeff from Sword of Health here. In today's video, I'll be going over a ton of things that you should know in order to pass your NASM CES exam. The NASM CES, or Corrective Exercise Specialist course, is not NASM's main personal training certification. The CES certification is possibly their most well-known continuing education course though. If you're studying for your NASM personal training certification, these are the two videos you want. If you're studying for your Corrective Exercise Specialist exam, you're in the right place. So the CES exam is 100 multiple choice questions and you need to get 70% or higher to pass. The exam is unproctored and open book. Just because the exam is open book, that doesn't necessarily mean it's easy though. It also doesn't mean that you necessarily understand all of NASM's corrective exercise concepts going into that final test either. So in essence, the purpose of this video is to 1. Teach you the material in a different way. 2. Help you pass the final exam. Duh. Consider this video just another means of studying and learning NASM's material. In this video, we'll be referencing a study guide which you can download for free by going to this link located in the video description. All I ask for in exchange for the free guide and all this information is that you like the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. That support really helps us out over here and it's what allows us to keep making free content for all of you. Thank you so much for that support, everyone. I really appreciate it. So getting into to things now, I am not affiliated with NASM. I do like their courses for the most part, but all I really do is help you understand their material. I don't work for them. For those who watch my NASM CPT prep videos, you'll notice some of the content in this video is the same as those videos. That's because some of the content in that CPT course is the same as some of the content in this CES one. You'll notice that I dive into significantly more detail on certain things in this video though, since this course focuses on some things much more. So my recommendation to all of you is to watch this video all the way through once or twice, and then after that, maybe you'll want to skip around to certain chapters that you need more help with. I'll have those chapters time stamped down below. Again, this video isn't meant to replace the course, it's just meant to help you break down a lot of the material in what I think is an easier to absorb way. One last thing, I highly recommend that you watch these three videos to help you prepare for this exam. These videos go over anatomy that trainers should know, and that's crucial information as far as this course goes. Anyways, no more mumbo jumbo, let's get into it. We're kicking off today's video with the kinetic chain checkpoints. You you do need to memorize these things since they are likely to appear on the final exam. And these kinetic chain checkpoints are the things that you'll be focusing on in the upcoming posture analysis and also the upcoming assessment. So if you're analyzing a person's posture or if you're doing a dynamic assessment with a person, you'll be looking in to see what that person's feet and ankles are doing. You'll be looking at their knees and seeing what their knees are doing. You'll be seeing what their lumbo-pelvic hip complex is doing. This is basically just the hips. You'll be looking to see what their shoulders are doing. And then you'll also be keeping tabs on what that person's head and neck are doing as well. Moving on to the corrective exercise continuum. And this is possibly the most important thing to understand in this whole certification process. These are the things that you're gonna be doing to help clients move better and you do need to do them in this order. The first thing we're going to do is inhibit shortened overactive muscles. The next thing we'll do is lengthen those shortened overactive muscles and we're going to be doing that by stretching and typically static stretching is the main one that we're going to be focusing on here but of course these other ones might come into play as well. Step three is activate and that's going to be isolated strengthening and in this activate phase we're going to want to focus on strengthening underactive lengthened muscles. Then we have the fourth and final step, integrate, and integrated dynamic movements kind of just tie everything together. So we're trying to get the entire body moving together at that point. So we'll be coming back to that corrective exercise continuum soon. Let's cover some background information first. Okay, so next up we're going to talk about agonists and antagonists. An agonist is the prime mover or muscle that does most of the work during a specific exercise. An antagonist is the muscle that opposes the agonist. So the easiest example here is the biceps and triceps. I'm doing a biceps curl, the biceps are the agonists, meaning they do most of the work. The opposing muscle group, the triceps, would be the antagonist. So I'm gonna bicep curl my cell phone a little bit here, and essentially when I'm doing this, my biceps, which are right here, are doing most of the work. They're the agonist or the prime mover because they are doing most of the work to move this cell phone. As I'm doing that movement, my triceps, which are located on the opposite side of my arm, 
they're shut off through a process called reciprocal inhibition. And it makes sense that that would be the case because as these muscles here are shortening and contracting, these muscles back here are lengthening and they can't be all that strong in that lengthening position. Again, they're being shut off through a process called reciprocal inhibition. Make sure you know that one. And I also like the biceps and triceps example because pretty much everyone knows where the biceps and triceps are. Typically when you have an agonist, again, we said the agonist of the biceps curl was the biceps, the antagonist is going to be on the opposite side of that same structure. Keep that in mind. So based on everything I just told you, if I'm doing a leg extension, what muscle group is the agonist and what muscle group is the antagonist? The agonist would be the quadricep muscles. They're the ones that are actually doing the leg extension and the antagonist, the muscles that are being lengthened and shut off due to reciprocal inhibition. Again, they're on the opposite side of the leg. Those would be the hamstring muscles. Then you also have synergists, which assist prime movers or agonists with movements. So coming back to this biceps curl, of course there are smaller muscles in my forearm and wrist that are also helping out with this movement. They're just not doing as much work as my biceps, so they would be synergists in this curling motion. So alongside agonists and synergists, we also have stabilizer muscles, and those are muscles that support the body as the prime mover, the agonist, and and synergists do their thing. On a different but related note, let's also talk about different types of muscle contractions. First up, we have static or isometric contractions. These contractions occur when there is no change in muscle length. And if we look at this person doing a plank here, they're not moving, so yeah, there is no change in muscle length going on. Everything is static or isometric. A concentric contraction is when the muscle shortens and an eccentric contraction is when a muscle lengthens. As I'm doing a pec fly, my pec muscles are contracting concentrically because they are shortening and they are getting tightened. Again, as I go into this motion here, you can see, you can kind of see it happening. Yeah, they're shortening, they're contracting. That being said, on the back motion of the pec fly, those same pec muscles are now lengthening and that is the eccentric portion of the pec fly. And you'll notice that most exercises do have a concentric and an eccentric portion. If I'm doing a bench press or a push up, as I'm pushing, that would be the concentric portion because again, my pec muscles, that'd be the prime mover of the movement. They're shortening as I'm pushing. And then on the way down like this, those same pec muscles are lengthening. Therefore, that is the eccentric portion of that lift. A question that you'll see sometimes on exams is which type of muscle contraction leads to the most muscle breakdown, soreness, and potentially even muscle growth? The answer is the eccentric contraction or that portion of the lift. And lengthening that eccentric portion of the lift is more likely to lead to DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness, and potentially even muscle gain. Next up, we're talking about planes of motion and movement. Before we get into those planes of motion and movement, there are some important things for us to quickly discuss here too. For example, we have these anatomical directions, superior being toward the head of the body, inferior being lower or further away from the head, anterior being the front of the body, posterior being the back of the body, medial being towards the midline of the body, and lateral being away from the midline of the body, proximal being nearest to the trunk or the point of origin, and distal being furthest away from the trunk or the point of origin. Again, superior would be like my head is superior to my shoulder because it's higher up. Inferior, my shoulder is inferior to my head because it's lower. Anterior, again, is just the front of the body. Again, posterior is the back of the body. Medial would be towards the midline of the body. Lateral would be the opposite, so it's further away from the midline of the body. Proximal would be nearest to the trunk, so Let's say this part of my upper arm is proximal relative to this part of my arm. And then distal is furthest away from the trunk. So my hand is distal relative to my elbow. You need to have a decent understanding of all these different things before we can actually move into the other stuff. Anyway, we have three different planes. We have the transverse plane, the frontal plane, and the sagittal plane. The transverse plane divides the body into top and bottom halves. The frontal plane divides the body into front and back halves. And then we have the sagittal plane, which divides the body into left and right halves. Next up, we'll be talking about the movements that take place in each of these planes. In the sagittal plane, we have flexion, which is the decrease of the joint 
joint angle. We have extension, which is an increase of the joint angle. We have dorsiflexion, which is moving the top of the foot towards the shin. And then we have plantar flexion, which is moving the sole of the foot down towards the ground. So flexion would be this, because as you can see, I'm decreasing the joint angle here. It is going down. Extension is the exact opposite. Look as the joint angle is expanding here. So it's going up, so that's extension. Can't really show you dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, but dorsiflexion is literally if I just kind of pull my toes up towards my shin, so I'm lifting my foot up off the ground, and plantar flexion is just me planting my foot back down to the ground. So pretty self-explanatory, I think. And again, all of those are movements that go in the sagittal plane, so this one right here. And I have a good way to remember all of that, so we'll be going over that in one sec. So if we look at this sagittal plane that divides the body into left and right halves, we see that it kind of goes out in front of the body, and it also kind of goes back behind the body. So basically, again, it's going in front of the body, and it's going behind the body. So the way you remember which movements go in the sagittal plane is they go in front of the body or they go kind of in back of the body. Again, if we look at flexion and extension, flexion is kind of happening in front of the body. And if we look at extension, it's kind of happening back behind the body. It would happen even more if I was doing extension with the shoulder. This brings me to the frontal plane, which divides the body into front and back halves. So the sagittal plane goes this way and this way to the front and the back of the body. And the frontal plane goes to the left and the right of the body. We already said that because the sagittal plane, the movements follow that plane of motion. So to the front and the back of the body, where then do these movements in the frontal plane go? Yes, you're probably thinking it right now, they go to the right and the left of the body. So if we're looking at this other picture, again, they go to the right and the left of the body. So movements in the frontal plane, we have adduction or movements toward the midline. I'll show you all of these in a second. We have abduction, a abduction, movement away from the midline of the body. We have elevation, moving to a superior position, scapula, Depression, again, that's scapula. Don't really need to worry about that so much. We have inversion, tilting of the foot towards the towards the midline. Eh, don't really need to worry about that one too much as well. And eversion, tilting the foot away from the midline. For inversion and eversion, I would actually look these two up on your own. They're fairly unlikely to appear on your test. These are pretty good to know though. For elevation and depression of the scapula, these are incredibly unlikely to appear anywhere on your test. However, adduction and abduction, these are fairly likely to show up on your test in one form or another. So we already said movements in the frontal plane go to the right and the left of the body. So the way I remember adduction and abduction, or a deduction and a abduction, is adduction is when I'm adding my arm back to the body. And a abduction or abduction is when I'm moving my arm away from the body. Next up, we're talking about movements in the transverse plane. And again, the transverse plane divides the body into top and bottom halves. This is probably the most confusing of the three. And with the frontal plane, we see that this clearly goes to the, the right and the left of the body. With the sagittal plane, it clearly goes to the front and the back side of the body. And then we kind of have this weird little rotation-y thing here. But it's important to notice that because for the transverse plane, most of the movements have a rotational component. So scrolling down to movements in the transverse plane, of course we do have rotation, blah, blah, blah. We also have pronation, which I'll show you guys what that looks like in a second. But basically it's rotating the forearm or foot palm side down. We have supination, which is pretty much the exact opposite. We have horizontal abduction or horizontal abduction. I'll show you what that looks like in a second. And we also have horizontal adduction. I'm also going to show you guys what that looks like as well. So rotation could be a whole bunch of different things. Like essentially if I'm doing a torso rotation and I'm rotating like that with a cable or a band, of course, that is an example of rotation. Pronation would simply be this palm side down with my hand and wrist and supination would be the exact opposite of that. And the way I like to remember supination is cup of soup. So that's what supination is going from this to that. And you remember supination by cup of soup. Next, we have horizontal abduction and horizontal adduction. I'm actually going to show you horizontal adduction first. Pretty much what that looks like would be a fly motion. So kind of like this sort of a motion if I'm doing it on both sides here. If I'm doing one arm at a time, it kind of looks like a punch where I'm punching across my body like that. Think of it like I'm adding my arm back to my body. Horizontal adduction. And then horizontal abduction would be the exact opposite. So it's me coming back like that. 
okay? So horizontal adduction would be fly motion, horizontal abduction or horizontal abduction is basically the exact opposite, so almost more of like a reverse fly kind of a motion. At the end of the day, remember this, if the movement has any kind of a rotation in it, it's going to go in this transverse plane. So it's possible that you'll get a question or two where you'll be shown an exercise and you'll have to identify what movement is taking place. And you might also have to identify what plane of motion the movement is occurring in. If we look at a lateral raise exercise, what action is taking place there? I'll give you guys a few seconds to think about that. So it would be abduction happening in the frontal plane because that's movement away from the midline of the body. Again, it kind of looks something like that. So let's talk about another quick example now and this time the example is going to be a little bit more complicated because now we're talking about the squat. So during the lowering phase of a squat you're experiencing hip flexion, knee flexion, and ankle dorsiflexion. During the lifting phase of a squat you're experiencing hip extension, knee extension, and ankle plantar flexion. So basically during a squat we're just looking at flexion and extension. So which of these three planes does that exercise take place in? It would be the sagittal plane because if we go down to here we can see that flexion and extension take place in the sagittal plane. So don't drive yourself crazy with these sorts of examples, but do your best to generally understand where exercises go within these planes. And then of course also try to do the same thing with knowing which movements also occur in each plane. Since we're talking about muscles and motions and all of that stuff, let's go over some related vocab that you should know as well. First up we have the muscle origin and that is the more stable or beginning muscle attachment. The muscle origin is generally more close to the center or midline of the body. Next up we have the muscle insertion and that is the less stable and more distal muscle attachment. Next up we have neural drive and I actually got a neural drive question on my final exam. So neural drive is the rate and volume of activation signals a muscle receives from the central nervous system. Shortened muscles experience too much neural drive Lengthened underactive muscles experience too little, so make sure that you have a general understanding of everything that we just went over right there. Still working on some vocab here. Next up we have proprioception, and that is the cumulative input from sensory afferent neurons. It should say afferent neurons, and then it would be correct to the central nervous system. We also have sensor and motor integration, and that's the ability of the CNS, central nervous system, to gather sensory info to execute a motor response. It's very possible that you could have an intra or intermuscular coordination question on your test. Intra is one muscle and inter is multiple muscles. Think interstate, again, lots of different highways and interstates, you know, going into each other. So intermuscular, is multiple muscle coordination. And something very related to that is a force couple relationship that is the synergistic action of muscles to create movement around a joint. So it's a bunch of muscles working together. So on my final CES exam, I did have a question regarding motor behavior, motor control, motor learning, one of these guys, I can't remember which one it was, but it's just good to have a general understanding of what each one of these things is. First up, we have motor behavior. That's the body's response to internal and external environmental stimuli. Then we have motor control, and that's used by the CNS, central nervous system, to assimilate and integrate sensory information with previous experiences. We also have motor learning. Practice and experience leads to a relatively permanent change in a person's ability to move well. And then last but not least, motor development and the change in motor behavior over time throughout a person's lifespan, that is motor development. So subtle differences between some of these things. But again, it's a very good chance that you're gonna have a question regarding some of this stuff right here. So you have afferent and efferent neurons and every once in a while, NASM will throw a question at you regarding these different types of neurons. Anyway, afferent are sensory neurons that carry signals from the sensory stimuli towards the CNS. And then you have efferent, and those are motor neurons that carry signals from the central nervous system to the muscles to create movement. Probably not worth memorizing, but good to go over, and this is definitely something that you could always look up while you're taking that final exam, and you could look that up in that NASM search bar. So when we're talking about the core, generally we can break it down into two different categories. 
we have the local musculature and we have the global musculature. Local muscles connect to the spine and they help the lumbopelvic hip complex with stabilization. These muscles are generally a little bit deeper. Your transverse abdominis would be an example. Again, that transverse abdominis, the muscle that you're mainly training in like a plank or a dead bug, that muscle is primarily going to be helping you with stabilization and core endurance. As far as the global muscles go, these muscles originate at the pelvis, rib cage, and lower extremities, and they're a little bit different. They're primarily type two or fast twitch muscles. So your rectus abdominis, your glute muscles, those would be examples of global core muscles. Again, these guys are less focused on muscular endurance and they're a little bit more focused on power. Okay, so we have four different movement systems. We have the deep longitudinal system, we have the posterior oblique subsystem, we have the anterior oblique subsystem, and we have the lateral subsystem. Essentially, these systems consist of several muscles each. They also consist of fascia and tendons and ligaments. Each one of the four helps you to move in a meaningful way, and that's why they're important. By the way, I did have at least one subsystem question on my exam, so we won't be going into extreme detail on any of these systems. Also, these are things that are probably not worth memorizing, just having a general understanding of. So in the deep longitudinal system, we have the erector spinae, the thoracolumbar fascia, the sacrotuberous ligament, etc. And this one, primarily what it does is it regulates ground response forces when walking, moving, etc. Before I talk about the posterior oblique subsystem, if you did get a question on any of these four systems, by the way, again, this is a time where I think it would be great to utilize that NASM search function and just make sure you look it up before you answer that multiple choice question. Again, remember, this test is open book and because of that, some of these questions are gonna be pretty tough. Anyways, posterior oblique subsystem, we have the glute max, the lats, the SI joint, thoracolumbar fascia. When someone walks, runs, it transfers force between the lower and upper extremities. It's important with rotational activities and it helps to maintain alignment with the sacroiliac and the lumbopelvic joints. Next up, we have the anterior oblique subsystem. And here we're looking at the internal and external obliques, the adductors, hip external rotators, so on and so forth and this is involved in pelvic stability and it's involved in rotation alongside the POS, which POS stands for posterior oblique subsystem. So they work hand in hand with each other. And this one plays a large role in leg swing. So just keep that in mind. Last but not least, we have the lateral subsystem. We got glute medius, the TFL, tensor fascia lata, adductors, QL, and this one is involved also in pelvic stability in the frontal plane um, during single legged movements. And here we can see a picture of glute medius. This is not the entire lateral subsystem or anything like that, but that's a nice picture of glute medius right there. So anyways, you don't need to be an expert on any of these four different subsystems. I actually left out a ton of details there, but that's totally fine because again, if you get a question on any of these four, that would definitely be a time to look up any of these systems in the NASM search function. The test is open book, so you can do that. And because the test is open book, oftentimes those questions will be a little bit tougher. So again, use that search function as you need to and just have a general understanding of what we're going over right here. Okay, so this is gonna be a huge part of the exam and it's also gonna be a really big part of the rest of this video. Of course, we're talking about overactive shortened and underactive lengthened muscles. So when you have an overactive and shortened muscle, elevated neural drive, which we've talked about before, causes a muscle to be stuck in a chronic contracted state. When we have an underactive and lengthened muscle, a muscle's antagonist pulls it into a chronically elongated state inhibiting neural drive. Make sure you guys understand everything I just said there. Another friendly reminder, I do have three videos that I'd highly recommend for those who need help learning basic muscular and skeletal anatomy. Of course, you can't truly understand overactive and underactive muscles unless you have a general understanding of anatomy in the first place. And all of that is super important for this test. Anyways, moving on to postural distortions now and postural distortions really are just overactive and underactive muscles 
muscles. So first we have John does three cross syndromes, which of course you can only see two of them right here. We have upper cross syndrome and we have lower cross syndrome, but you can actually have both of these two things going on at once. You could either have this one going on by itself, this one going on by itself, and the third cross syndrome would be to have upper and lower cross syndrome at the same time. We also have Kendall's four postures right here, and this is just a different way of looking at all of this stuff. We do have ideal posture right here, which we actually do still have some curvature of the spine. Your spine is not meant to be totally flat. So we do still have a small lordotic curve here. We do still have a small kyphotic curve right here. Next up, we have kyphosis and lordosis, and we can see those same curves we just talked about over here, except now they are much more accentuated. This lordotic curve in the lower back, that's now too big. And this kyphotic curve up here in the upper middle back, again, that's now too big. Next up we have flat back and again having a totally flat back is actually not desirable so again this is a postural distortion. Then we also have this sway back posture and this one's a little bit different and honestly I don't think it's quite as important to understand as this kyphosis and lordosis one but anyways in this sway back we still have a bit of a kyphotic thing going on here so a bit too great of a kyphotic curve right here. We also have a bit of a posterior pelvic tilt and there's a few other things going on. We should have a little bit more of a lordotic curve right here. So again, a few different things going on with that sway back posture as well. Now let's get into more detail on postural distortions and patterns. This overly lordotic posture, the one that looks like you're sticking your butt out for Instagram, this is referred to as lower cross syndrome. Again, make sure you know this is lower cross syndrome. NASM likes that terminology quite a bit. So essentially when we're dealing with a client whose lordotic curve is too great, which we can kind of see in this picture, that lordotic curve's a little too great. We're all supposed to have a small curve there, but not that much. The sentence here is a little bit too redundant, uh, but it is true. The lumbar extensors and the hip flexors, they are too tight and short. On the other hand, your hip extensors, which would be things like your glutes and your hamstrings, and your core muscles, well, those are all lengthened and weakened. If my back is too arched like this, well you can kind of see basically my abdominal muscles are in a constantly stretched out state and they can't really be too strong from that position. So again, from an exaggerated lordotic curve here, my abs are pretty much gonna be weak by default. What also happens here is as this lordotic curve increases, these muscles kind of just get stuck shortened, which is also not good. So they're locked tight and short. And then these hamstring and glute muscles on the opposite side of the body, they're lengthened a little bit too long and they are tight, so they're tight and over lengthened. So I would definitely make sure to memorize this stuff right here. The hip flexors and lumbar extensors, they're too tight and they're too short when you're dealing with an exaggerated lordotic curve and your hip extensors, which really are the muscles on the opposite side of the body, the glutes and the hamstrings, um, they are also tight, but they're tight because they're over lengthened and they're weakened. And again, if we go back up to here, it all makes sense that that would be the case. So make sure you understand, again, which muscles are too tight, which ones are also too tight, but too tight because they're lengthened and make sure you understand why those muscles are that way. So next up, we're gonna be talking about this kyphotic posture. And this one is also super common, just like the lordotic posture. Both of these two are very likely to appear on your exam. By the way, I should mention here that an overly kyphotic posture is very often referred to as upper cross syndrome by NASM. Again, this rounded forward kyphotic posture is upper cross syndrome. Make sure you know that. Anyway, in this kyphotic posture, the anterior chest, shoulder muscles, lats, and neck extensors are all too tight and shortened. The rhomboids, lower and mid traps, and neck flexors are all lengthened and weak. And of course, if we're looking at someone who has too great of a kyphotic curve, it pretty much looks like this, this hunchback or this dowager's hump thing, doesn't really matter what you call it. It goes by many names. Not only is it not the best to look at, but unfortunately it does cause some biomechanical problems oftentimes as well. And I think the easiest way to remember this is basically if I am too kyphotic, kind of like this, 
Well, basically, all of the muscles on the front side of my body, which the pecs are the most obvious ones, well, they are too tight and shortened. And you can kind of see that on me right here, right now. Like, they're, they're all bunched up right here, my pecs. And the opposite is true of most of those back muscles, like my rhomboids, for instance. The rhomboids, their whole job is to pull my shoulder and my arm back, right? Retraction of the shoulder blade. So if I'm constantly here, well, basically my rhomboids and my lower and mid traps, they're just overstretched this way all the time. And they can't really be strong from that overstretched position. So they are weak and overstretched. Whereas my pecs, they are too tight as well. But instead of being overstretched, they're actually kind of just stuck in this shortened position. Definitely make sure you have a good understanding of an overly lordotic posture and an overly kyphotic posture. By the way, these two things can happen at the same time. In fact, they usually do happen at the same time, so also be aware of that. Next up, we have anterior pelvic tilt, and this usually occurs alongside a lordotic posture, as well as kyphosis, and it kind of is what I just explained to all of you guys before. So as you can see, this dude's pelvis tilts forward a little bit too much. You can kind of see this angle here, tilting too forward toward his anterior or his front, as opposed to this guy whose pelvis is more or less straight. Anterior pelvic tilt is very, very closely associated with an overly lordotic posture. It's also associated with kyphosis. Again, all of these things oftentimes happen at the same time, but as you can see, this guy's lordotic curve is just, it's way too excessive. And because of that, some of these muscles in his low back are too short and tight. His abdominal muscles are long, taut and weakened, like we said before, and like we also said before with the lordotic posture, the muscles, his hip flexors on the front side of his leg, they are too short and tight, his hamstrings and his glutes, they're long, taut and weakened, and a lot of this is just due to poor lifestyle choices. This guy is probably sitting way too much, not moving around nearly enough, and because of that, certain muscles just aren't getting used enough. There's also forward head posture, and the overactive muscles here are the cervical spine extensors, the upper traps, and the levator scapula. And as you can see, again, this dude's head is just too far forward. So I would actually memorize which muscles are overactive here. Yes, that's right, I did say memorize. And as far as underactive muscles go, well, if we go back to kyphosis, again, kyphosis and forward head posture, typically happen at the same time. So the underactive muscles are pretty much gonna be the same. And you almost certainly will get a question or two where you have to identify what a person has going on posture-wise. So be able to pick out if a person has a lordotic or a kyphotic posture. So you'll notice how I didn't break down flat back and sway back postures nearly as much as the different other posture types. That's because they're a little bit less important, but they definitely could still pop up on that final exam. So be ready to look them up in that good old NASM search function, just like we've mentioned with a few other things already. And we're back to a little bit of vocab now. So we have regional interdependence. This is an important one to know. Basically pain in a certain area could be caused by an issue in a different location. And an example here, knee pain could be caused by a hip problem. This happens very often in the real world. When it comes to scope of practice, guys, whether we're talking about orthopedic things or discomfort or pain when people are moving, or if we're talking about dietary things, when in doubt, refer out and assume that NASM is gonna take that approach when it comes to designing these tests as well. So this is a quick one. The human movement system is composed of three things. We have the skeletal system, the nervous system, and the muscular system. All right, moving on here. So SMR stands for self-myofascial rolling, not self-myofascial release anymore, they changed that and pressure is determined by roller density and diameter. There's also myofascial flossing, which really we're not gonna be talking about much at all today. It's also called voodoo flossing, and it's done by wrapping a latex band around muscles and then stretching. So myofascial rolling training variables, don't memorize any of these things, but very good to know. Frequency, you're gonna be doing it most days of the week, ideally. 
reps you're going to be holding 30 to 60 seconds on areas of discomfort i take it back that one actually you probably do want to memorize and you want to do four to six reps as far as the intensity goes there should be some discomfort but it shouldn't be too extreme and you should be able to relax and breathe in terms of duration we're looking at five to ten minutes total time and 90 to 120 seconds per muscle group anyways moving on to types of stretching in the lengthening phase which happens after that inhibition phase and we're looking at static stretching, which is a typical stretch, and that you're gonna wanna hold for at least 30 seconds. Some dynamic stretching can also be used here, and when we're talking about dynamic stretching, those are active stretches where you're using muscle force production and the body's momentum to take a joint through full range of motion. We also have neuromuscular stretching, and neuromuscular stretching incorporates static stretching and isometric contraction. It's basically PNF. So when we're talking about neuromuscular muscular stretching, again, PNF stretching, there's a few different ways you can do it. You can have a partner helping you out, which we can see in this picture down here. You can also use a band or some other device to do these sorts of things on yourself. Anyways, I don't think we need to read through all these different directions, but again, these slides are online for anybody who wants to look these things over before taking their test. Of course, you can also just pause this video right now and take longer to look at this if you want to. So there's a few other types of stretching. We have active stretching, which we're doing multiple reps of a two second Second static stretch but a contraction of the antagonist muscle is also present to induce reciprocal inhibition we also have ballistic stretching which is similar to dynamic stretching but more bouncy and high speed there is a greater chance of injury with this type of stretching and that's why ballistic stretching is generally something you're not going to see recommended this is also a good time to talk about reciprocal inhibition and autogenic inhibition because both of these two things are pretty likely to appear on the final exam so reciprocal inhibition is the relaxation of muscles on one side of a joint to accommodate the contraction on the other side and i just showed you guys reciprocal inhibition with the biceps and triceps example you also have autogenic inhibition and this is the ability of a muscle to relax when it experiences a stretch or increased tension in nasm's case autogenic inhibition comes up a lot when we're talking about self myofascial release they're big on smr hence the foam roller here so when you're holding that extra tense spot for 30 seconds which you are supposed to do that autogenic inhibition is going to kick in and cause that muscle to relax so just make sure you can differentiate between these two things on the test since we just talked about reciprocal inhibition let's also talk about altered reciprocal inhibition and that's when an overactive shortened muscle causes less activation of its antagonist. And an example there, an overactive shortened psoas could cause glute max to be less effective, and that's because those two muscles do opposite things. So psoas being over tight makes glute max less effective at its job. And then we have relative flexibility, the body's ability to find the path of least resistance to achieve a task, even if the movement pattern is suboptimal. So an example there, as I'm reaching up overhead, maybe I'm kind of shrugging my shoulder up to get my arm up overhead. Again, my body is gonna find a way to get that arm up overhead even if that pattern is suboptimal. You're also likely to have a Golgi tendon organ, GTO, and muscle spindle question on the big test. The GTO is located at the point where the muscle and tendon meet, which is the musculotendinous junction. The GTO is sensitive to change in muscle tension and the speed of tension change. Muscle spindles are sensory organs that lie parallel to the muscle fibers, and they detect muscle length and the speed slash rate at which a muscle is stretched. So based on those two descriptions, as you can see, both of these two things perform very similar actions. If you're given a multiple choice question where you have to choose between these two things, it's very useful to know where they're located because that will allow you to answer a multiple choice question correctly. Building upon everything we just said there, we have disfacilitation, muscles and muscle spindles calm down a bit after some static stretching and that takes about 30 or so seconds to really see much of that calming down action. And just a little bit more information on GTOs, Golgi tendon organs. I did have at least one GTO question on my exam and these are activated by tension exerted on muscle tendons. They're less associated with static stretching, more with dynamic since they're active during muscle contraction. 
GTO inhibition stops around 60 to 100 milliseconds after stretching. The only reason I'm including this number is because I'm 99% sure my question on that final exam actually had something to do with this 60 to 100 milliseconds. I wouldn't memorize any of this stuff, but again, just all good information to have somewhere in the back of your head. So next up we have warm up duration, and this would be just like a warm up before any workout with a client. You do some myofascial rolling, and that's 90 seconds to 120 seconds to improve viscoelasticity, temperature, increase inhibition of the muscles, etc. And like we saw in this previous slide up here, that's 90 to 120 seconds per muscle group. For static stretching, we're gonna be doing less than 60 seconds per muscle group. That being said, we do want at least 30 seconds. For dynamic stretching, we're doing less than or equal to 90 seconds per muscle group. Then after that, we're gonna be doing some task specific activities for five to 15 minutes. Maybe I'm a pitcher and I'm gonna practice some pitching, right? Anything specific to the actual activity that I'm about to be doing. So when it comes to stretching, foam rolling, or pretty much anything else, there's gonna be contraindications and precautions to doing any of those things. Of course, we're talking about contraindications here. And contraindications would be a strong reason to not do any of these things. So we have acute injury or muscle strain slash tear of the muscle being stretched. We have recent musculoskeletal surgery or treatment. We have acute rheumatoid arthritis of the affected joint, and we have osteoporosis. Again, these would be reasons to not do stretching. Doesn't mean you couldn't get like a doctor's note and then do some of these things. It could benefit your client. But again, these are contraindications or reasons to not do stretching. Keep in mind, every scenario is different. And these contraindications are a little bit different than precautions to stretching or precautions to foam rolling or anything like that. NASM has charts showing precautionary things when it comes to stretching and contraindications to all those things. So be ready to search that while you're taking your exam. So we have some acute variables for static stretching and static stretching can be done daily unless specified otherwise. You'll be doing one to four reps per muscle group. Your duration is gonna be 20 to 30 seconds static hold and you're gonna hold a little bit longer for older adults. So next up we have the training variables for isolated strengthening and we're gonna be doing that three to five days a week. Generally, we're gonna be aiming for 10 to 15 reps. And then we have this tempo here, and this tempo is super important to memorize, to be honest with you. So we have four seconds on the eccentric part of the lift. That's the part of the lift where the prime mover is stretching. Then we have a two second isometric part, and the isometric would be the part of the lift, let's say the bottom of the lift, where there is no movement taking place. Then you have the one second concentric part of the lift, and that would be that last part where you're getting that explosion. So contraindications to isolated strengthening, these really wouldn't be things to memorize, just good to look over, acute injury or muscle strain, tear of the muscle being strengthened, blah, blah, blah. Pretty similar overall to what we talked about before, where we we're talking about the contraindications to stretching as well. We also have acute training variables for integrated dynamic movement. And this would be the last part in that chain that we were talking about earlier. So the first thing we're gonna do is inhibit overactive shortened muscles. We're then also going to lengthen those overactive shortened muscles. Then we're going to try to activate and we're gonna try to activate the overstretched underactive muscles. And then we're gonna try and tie everything together with some different dynamic movements. We're still looking for 10 to 15 reps. We're looking for one to three sets here. And the duration here, as in the tempo, it's more controlled. So it's not necessarily that four to one tempo that we just talked about before. That being said, when in doubt, when you're getting a question on that final exam, assume the four to one tempo. And again, these contraindications to integrated dynamic strengthening, we really don't need to memorize these. I don't even think we need to read them out loud. If you wanna look them over, feel free to pause the video right here. Of course, you can also download this guide and look it over that way too. This is actually a really important slide right here. So this is the CES, the Corrective Exercise Assessment Flow. So this is the order in which you're gonna be doing things. So the first thing you're gonna be doing is a client intake. We're gonna talk more about what a client intake is very soon. After that client intake, the next thing you wanna do is a static postural assessment. 
And that's basically where you're assessing someone's posture. You'll be looking for some of those postural deviations that we talked about earlier in this video, upper lower cross syndrome being examples of that. And then after that, you're gonna to go to the overhead squat and you might have to do one of the modified versions of the overhead squat as well. Then after doing that overhead squat stuff, you have a few optional things and the optional things are dynamic or loaded assessments. After that, we have mobility assessments and you're not gonna be doing every mobility assessment with every client, that would just be crazy what mobility assessments you do with a client that will depend on their static postural assessment their goals and what some of these other things have looked like and essentially all of this information the client intake the static postural assessment and the rest of this stuff that's going to dictate what your corrective exercise programming is going to look like and again this stands for inhibit lengthen activate and integrate Maybe you can think of a good acronym for this I-L-A-I. Um, I don't know, I got nothing right now. But yeah, maybe you can think of a good acronym to remember that. So next up we have the client intake. Like we just said, it is the first step in the assessment process. The PAR-Q or PAR-Q plus should be included. Those are just yes or no questionnaires that determine whether or not someone has different health issues potentially going on. There's a general lifestyle information um, aspect to this that that's all information that should be gathered in this process. Previous injuries should also be discussed and time should be spent on goals and rapport building. We talked about the kinetic chain checkpoints very early into this video. And yeah, these are the points that you should be observing when you're observing someone's posture, whether they're moving or they're standing still. And these points are the feet and ankles, the knees, the lumbo-pelvic hip complex, the shoulders and the head and neck. So when we're talking about static posture, this would just be observing someone's posture as they're just standing there normally. We're gonna be looking at the anterior view. That's the front side of the body. Hopefully you know that by now. If you don't, you might need to study quite a bit more. We're also looking at the lateral view. That's gonna be the side of the body. And we're also looking at the posterior view and that is the back side of the body. Now, when you're doing a static postural assessment, you are looking for certain things. For instance, knee valgus, or when the knees kind of bow in towards each other, knock knee, that is really one of the main things you're, you're looking for. And that is best viewed to see if someone has knee valgus from the anterior view. So you're gonna be able to see that best when you're looking at someone from the front which I think makes sense. And really none of this stuff is worth memorizing at all. It's really just common sense for the most part. For instance, if we're looking at someone's lumbo-pelvic hip complex and we're looking to see if they have an anterior or posterior pelvic tilt, you're really only gonna be able to see that from the lateral view, the side. You might be able to see it a little bit from the back, but it's really not gonna be nearly as obvious as it's going to be from the side. So next up, we're gonna take a look at some transitional movement assessments. First off, you'd be doing that client intake. Then after that, you'd be doing some static postural assessments. And then right after that, you'd be moving to the transitional movement assessments. Now these assessments involve movement, but no change in support. Body weight resistance is used. So the first transitional movement assessment you would do is the overhead squat. And you might have to do a modified overhead squat depending on what your client has going on. And after that, you'd make a decision as to whether or not you think your client can do the single-legged squat. If you don't feel comfortable with them doing a single-legged squat, maybe a split squat makes sense for that client. But then again, that split squat might also not make sense for your client. And without wasting any time jumping right into the overhead squat, Typically, this is the first movement assessment done. The overhead squat assesses dynamic posture, core stability, and neuromuscular control. And it is a good way to spot muscle imbalances, such as knee valgus, which we're gonna talk much more about that one very soon, limited ankle mobility, etc. A little more information on the overhead squat, and you don't have to memorize any of this stuff, but we're just gonna be going over basically how you would set this up. You're gonna start off with the client standing on a flat and stable surface. Their feet should be shoulder width apart and they should be pointing straight ahead. The feet and ankles should be in a neutral position and the assessment should be performed with shoes off to better view the client's foot and ankle complex. And the client should have their elbows fully extended with their arms completely overhead. In terms of depth for the overhead squat, your client should attempt to be squatting to parallel where the femur, being that big upper leg bone, 
uh, is parallel with the ground. That being said, a lot of clients won't be able to achieve that depth and in that case, you can reduce it if necessary. The client will perform roughly five reps while the trainer views from the front and from the side. This number here can vary a little bit if necessary, and you do want to view from the front and from the side just so you can see what's going on from multiple angles. Okay, so when we're viewing the overhead squat from the anterior or the front, we're looking at the feet and the ankles, and we're also looking at the knees. If your client were to actually perform this movement perfectly, their feet should stay straight ahead as they're performing their reps. Also, if your client were performing their reps perfectly, their knees should track straight forward over the second and third toes. We do also want to view the overhead squat from the side or the lateral lateral viewpoint and from that lateral viewpoint we're going to be viewing the lumbo-pelvic hip complex the hips and we're going to be viewing the shoulders from the side as well now we're going to be going over some examples of where a client does an overhead squat but they don't do the movement exactly perfectly, AKA overactive and underactive muscles. You don't necessarily have to memorize everything we're about to go over, but you should understand pretty much everything I'm explaining. So if you have a client doing an overhead squat and their feet are turning out kind of like what you can see right here, the overactive muscles in this case would be the gastrocnemius and the soleus, and these muscles exist on the backside of your calf, and the hamstring muscles would also be overactive in this instance as well. The underactive muscles would be the tibialis muscles, the anterior and posterior, and these are basically the muscles on the front side of your shin. Then the glutes would also be underactive in this situation as well. You're gonna notice that the glutes are gonna be underactive in a lot of the upcoming movement pattern discrepancies. Also, just as a rule of thumb for all of the upcoming examples, if muscles are overactive, generally speaking, that means we want to stretch them out or loosen them and if muscles are underactive, generally speaking, that means we want to strengthen them. So now let's talk about a client who's doing the overhead squat assessment and their knees cave in kind of like this. In that case, the overactive muscles would be the TFL, the tensor fascia lata, and the adductors. The TFL is a muscle that's right above the IT band. It kind of sits on the side of the hip there. And the adductors, those are the muscles that kind of bring the leg back towards the body. Also, a lot of the time, the TFL opposes the glute muscles. So you'll notice that if the TFL is overactive, essentially the glutes, they're gonna be underactive. So yeah, if the knees are caving in, the glutes are gonna be underactive as well as the anterior and posterior tibialis. Now, if a client's low back arches when they're doing their overhead squat, which would look something a little bit like this, some of their overactive muscles would likely be their hip flexors, their lumbar extensors, and their lats. When it comes to muscles that would be underactive in this case, we have glute max, we have the hamstrings, and we have the abdominals. And again, you don't necessarily need to memorize all of this stuff. Something that's useful to know is that if muscles on one side of the body are overactive, then in all likelihood, muscles on the opposite side of the body those are gonna be underactive. And we can see that here with the hip flexors being overactive and the hamstrings being underactive. Same thing here with the abdominals being underactive and the lumbar extensors being overactive. Now, if a client is doing an overhead squat and they're leaning way too far forward, it's a little bit of a funky picture right there. Really, you can only see her upper body, but yeah, she's leaning too far forward as she's doing the overhead squat. Again, overactive would be the hip flexors, the gastroc and soleus, the calf muscles. Um, overactive would also be the core muscles, at least the outermost core muscles, the rectus abdominis and the external obliques. And then when it comes to the underactive muscles, again, we have the glute max and we have the hamstrings. And then we also do have the lumbar extensors in this case too. And the last of these overactive and underactive slides for the overhead squat is when the arms fall forward. And when it comes to the overactive muscles, we're thinking about the lats, the pecs, and teres major, which that is a shoulder muscle. And pretty much all of that stuff should make sense when we're thinking back to our upper and lower cross syndrome examples that we discussed earlier in today's video. And they kind of should make sense for all of these other patterns as well. So make sure you understand all of that because that will help you understand these overactive and underactive muscles. So just a little bit more overhead squat information here. If the feet turn out, the heels rise, the knees bow in towards each other, knee valgus. 
if we see an excessive anterior pelvic tilt or if a, we see a weight shift or an excessive lean forward, if we see any of those things, we're going to perform heels elevated. So basically we're going to put something like a weight plate, just an inch or two high. We're gonna put that underneath the heels and then we're gonna have that person do the overhead squat. So if we put something like a weight plate underneath someone's heels and they do the overhead squat, and if their form improves, we wanna program for the foot and ankle. We can pretty much at that point guarantee that at least to some capacity, the foot and ankle is part of the problem. That's part of the reason why their overhead squat doesn't look that good. And again, if we elevate the heels and it doesn't make their squat, it doesn't clean that squat up, doesn't make it look better. Uh, at that point, we're looking to address the lumbopelvic hip complex. That's probably where most of those limitations are. And again, this heel elevated version of the overhead squat where maybe I have my client's heels on a weight plate or something like that, that would be one of the modified versions of the overhead squat. So if we're seeing an excessive anterior pelvic tilt or the arms falling forward during an overhead squat, another thing we can try is the overhead squat, except I guess it wouldn't really be an overhead squat because that client would be performing that squat, except instead of having their hands overhead, they would have their hands on their hips. And if a client's squat form improved when we did that hands on the hip modification version, well then we could assume that the shoulder complex is at least part of the problem there. Typically it's the lats really causing, uh, causing a problem there. So if, if it doesn't fix the issue, essentially we would have to address the core at that point and we could assume that the lats are not playing as big of a role. Again, we would address core stability if we did the hands on the hip version and their squat still didn't look all that much better afterwards. Next up, we have the single leg squat assessment and you won't be doing this one with all clients. It is somewhat advanced, so if you're concerned that your client will be able to balance on one leg, um, this would not be the assessment for them. To some extent, how deep you go here does depend on the client. It's also kind of hard to tell from this picture, but you're only squatting down to about 60 degrees of range of motion at the knee, so it's not like it's a 90 degree angle where it would be for the previous overhead squat. So again, you're not going down quite as far as before with that previous assessment. Anyways, for the single leg squat, there is strong inter and intra-rater reliability meaning that this test is easy to repeat and get similar results, whether it's you repeating the test multiple times or multiple trainers doing the test. We only need to worry about an anterior view or a view of the front side of the body for this one. Up to five reps will be completed for both sides. This number can vary a little bit person to person. The client squats as deep as possible while maintaining balance and returns to the starting position. Anyways, the single leg squat continued. The client stands on a flat, stable surface with hands on their hips and their eyes focus forward. The client lifts one foot approximately six inches off of the floor. The foot, the ankle, and the knee should be in a neutral straight ahead position. The only overactive and underactive thing we have to think about here is the knee kind of caving inwards. It's a little bit tough to see in this picture, but her knee is just kind of caving inwards a little bit towards the other side. And if we're thinking about the overactive muscles in this case, the adductors, again, that makes sense because the knee is being added too much back towards the midline of the body. The TFL is typically gonna be a problem in situations like this. And if we go down here, we can see that the glute max and glute medius, those are gonna be underactive because again, they kind of just oppose that TFL. So if the TFL is overactive, you know that these two are almost always gonna be underactive. And just like in a lot of other cases, the anterior and posterior tib are also underactive here as well. If you're unsure if a client can perform the single-legged squat, you want to ascertain whether or not the client can safely maintain the single leg position. If they can, then great, have them do the single leg squat and note compensations. How about this scenario though? Can the client safely maintain single leg position? No. How about the split stance? Okay, split stance is good, so do split squat assessment and record compensations there. So this split squat assessment is essentially a good option if for whatever reason you don't think your client can safely perform the single leg squat, 
and just a little information on it. You don't want your feet any wider than hip width. The toes should be pointed straight ahead. You do have your hands on the hips. You're gonna be viewing this one from the front side and back. The client does five reps in each view and the rear knee move towards the ground, but doesn't touch. Another faulty squat pattern they could ask you about is when a client is squatting, but their legs are kind of buckling together like we can see in this picture right here. There's a few things going on here, but if you see this pop up in any form on the test, you know the main reason for this happening is that the adductors are too strong and tight relative to the abductors. Basically, the glutes, mainly glute medius, is too weak in this situation. And this makes sense when you think about it because the adductors in your leg would be the things that are adding your leg back to your body and the abductors would be the things that are the muscles that are moving your leg away from the body. So if your adductors are too tight, again, the muscles adding the leg back to the body relative to your abductors, your abductors, well, you're, yeah, your, your knee is just gonna cave in like that. So this all makes sense if you think about it that way. This is also commonly referred to as knee valgus or knock knees. And ASM has a few different names for this. You're going to have questions about knees caving in on the test, so let's talk about it. We've already talked about knees caving in in a few different instances. We already talked about that before with the overhead squat, with the single leg squat, and we just talked about it a little bit more. NASM actually has a term for it or a name for it. It's called Pes Planus Distortion Syndrome, and it will almost certainly come up on your test in one form or another. So with this distortion syndrome at the ankle, you're gonna see a collapsed arch. At the knee joint, you're gonna see those knock knees, which you can kind of see right here, and they're a little bit internally rotated. This is usually the most obvious thing, and it's usually how this is initially found. And then at the hip, you're going to see extra adduction. Again, those legs being added to the body a little too much, like we just talked about. And we're gonna see internal rotation as well. Well, I guess we just can't escape these overactive and underactive muscles. For better or worse, this is a huge part of your test. Again, not everything is necessary to memorize. But if you understand how this stuff works well enough, you'll be able to pick it up on a multiple choice question. And that is really what is essential here. Like we just kind of said a few times now, uh, the adductors are gonna be overactive in that situation. Gastroc and soleus, those calf muscles, also gonna be overactive. And the hip flexors are typically gonna be overactive in this situation as well. Well, since the gastroc and soleus were overactive, we can make a safe bet that the uh, tibialis muscles, the muscles on the opposite side, they're gonna be underactive. And we kind of see the same thing with the hip flexors. They oftentimes oppose hamstrings and glute muscles, and that's kind of what we see right here. Okay, so next up we have the loaded movement assessments, and these are optional. We've got the loaded squat, we've got the standing push, the standing pull, and the standing overhead dumbbell press. In terms of that loaded squat assessment, we really don't have to memorize all this information, but you should definitely have a general idea of what it is. Anyways, your feet are gonna be hip to shoulder width apart. Your toes are gonna be pointed straight ahead. This can be done without shoes. You can also wear shoes if you need to. And the resistance should tire you, but not exhaust you. So there's actually a few different types of squats that you can test here. You can do front squats, you can do back squats, goblet squats, etc. All of those different variations work. There would be more variations that would work here as well. And you should choose a variation that you're gonna want your client to do in actual workouts. You're gonna have your client doing five reps and you're gonna be viewing that from the front, from the side and the back. And you're trying to get them to parallel depth or as close as they can get to that with comfort and good form. And just a little bit more information on the loaded squat assessment, a two zero two tempo. So again, first up we have the eccentric, so that's the portion where the prime mover is stretching. Then we have that isometric component and this there's no pause at all, so it's zero. So zero isometric component here. And then the concentric portion where essentially you're exploding back up, that's gonna be a two second explosion back upwards. You can change the weight as you go and you can have your clients do extra or less reps to determine their movement quality. In terms of the overhead dumbbell press assessment, you're gonna have the client fully press the weights overhead and you don't wanna be choosing super heavy weights or anything like that. Again, we're trying to assess movement with this. 
the client is going to do 10 reps. You're only going to be viewing from the side and we're using that same tempo that we just talked about before. So next up, we're gonna be talking about the pushing and pulling assessments. For both of these two assessments, the client should be standing in a narrow split stance. The client should be doing about 10 reps with challenge, but we're not looking for exhaustion. And with both of these two assessments, we're viewing things from the side. So we're looking at the lumbo pelvic hip complex, the shoulders, the cervical spine, or kind of like that upper back neck area, and the head. So looking at this slide, I want it to be clear that these two assessments are very similar and the compensation patterns that we're gonna go over for these two assessments are very similar as well. And here we are looking at the setup for the pushing assessment. Here you can see Alexis and she's pushing two cables right ahead here. She's in a split stance, so this is what it would look like doing a pushing assessment. And a pulling assessment, again, is pretty much the same exact thing, except this time we're pulling. Again, we're doing roughly 10 reps, and we're kind of just seeing how our client moves during those 10 reps, again, whether they are pushing or pulling, and like we said before, the weight here is not meant to be that heavy. A little bit of challenge should be there, but we're not looking for exhaustion. So back to our overactive and underactive muscles. In this case, you can see Alexis's head is just a little bit too far forward uh, beyond her shoulders here. So the overactive muscles in this case would be the levator scapula, which that muscle's job is to elevate the scapula, pushing everything up and usually a little bit forward. We also have the SCM, the sternocleidomastoid, which is a neck muscle. So again, that's overactive. We also have the cervical spine extensors, all of those things, again, being overactive when someone's head is too far forward during either of these two assessments. And then for underactive, we have the deep cervical flexors, and that should be no surprise because they oppose these cervical spine extensors. So if we're doing a pushing or a pulling assessment and someone's shoulders are too high or their scapula is too high, um, the overactive muscles typically are gonna be the levator scapula, again, elevating the scapula too much and the upper traps. And then for underactive, we have the lower traps. They're usually gonna be underactive, and oftentimes the traps are, the upper traps are gonna be overactive. So always keep that in mind with all these different patterns. And our last compensation pattern for both the pushing and pulling assessment is when you have a low back arch, which we can kind of see a little bit of a low back arch right here on Alexis. And none of these overactive muscles should be too surprising at this point. We have the hip flexors, which really the TFL, the psoas, and the rectus femoris are the main ones that we're thinking about there. We also have the lumbar extensors. And anytime we have too great of a lordotic curve back here, we can pretty much bank on these muscles here being underactive. So in this case, the underactive muscles are glute max, glute medius, and the abdominals. And again, that's gonna happen pretty much any time that we have too great of a lordotic curve right here in the lower back. Let's look at a possible exam question related to this stuff. What is overactive if the shoulder is elevated and the head is too far forward during this pull assessment? And I'm gonna give you some options as to what the overactive muscles are. Are they A, the lower traps and the lats, B, the levator scapula and the cervical spine extensors, C, the rhomboids and the pecs, or D, the upper traps and rhomboids? And I'm just gonna be back here hanging with my pups for a few seconds while you guys are thinking about the best answer to that question. If you chose B, the levator scapula and cervical spine extensors, you were correct. Those were the two most overactive muscles if you have a person doing this. So the lower traps in this situation would actually be underactive. People who have their shoulders kind of hiked up towards their ears all the time, they tend to be much more dominant with their upper traps rather than the lower or mid traps. The lats actually could be a little bit overactive, but again, this part kind of makes it so that that answer can't be right. The pecs would be overactive in this whole situation most likely, but the rhomboids would definitely be kind of overstretched, so that wouldn't be a great answer there. And the upper traps very likely would be too overactive on this person, but the rhomboids, well, they wouldn't be able to do their job with this person too well at all because everything is kind of hiked up and a little too far forward. So the best answer, even though some of these other answers could kind of make sense, is this one right here, B. And the biggest hint here is the levator scapula. Well, what does the levator scapula do? It elevates your scapula. So people whose shoulders are just all up here all the time, well, their levator scapula 
is definitely going to be overactive. Like we said, the upper traps would be as well. So yeah, a little bit of a tricky question here, but similar to what NASM will throw at you. So this is a good a time as any to go over this. Review, but don't memorize table 9-2 in the text. We've gone over many muscle imbalance or length tension relationships, but we can't cover every example. More are covered in the anatomy videos too. Next up, we'll be talking about the dynamic movement assessments. These are optional and we have the gait slash walking assessment, the depth jump assessment, and the Davies test. Moving on to the gait assessment now, and this is gonna be viewed from all three angles. Again, the front, the side, and the back. Feet should remain parallel, so they should be kind of just straight ahead. We don't want any turning outwards or turning inwards. The lumbo pelvic hip complex should not shift too much side to side. By the way, if it wasn't clear, a gait assessment is you analyzing a client while they're walking in a treadmill. Anyway, foot and arch should stay in a neutral position, so you don't want that arch collapsing inwards or outwards or anywhere. Like we said, it's done on a treadmill and it's done with an incline of one, and your client should be walking at a normal speed. What that speed is, of course, will vary a little bit person to person. Just like I've said a few times before, nothing to memorize here, but all good stuff to know. You should have a general idea of what this is. Next up, we have the depth jump assessment, and you're gonna have an individual standing on a 12 inch box. And basically you're gonna draw a target line, and that target line is gonna be 12 inches in front of the box. And the client is gonna hop off of the box with their feet basically just beyond that line. Upon landing, the client is gonna jump as high as possible. You're gonna be viewing this from the front and the side, and you're gonna be looking for the usual stuff, all the stuff that we've already talked about with the other assessments. And one to three reps per view is recommended. Next up, we have the Davies test. And for this one, you're gonna be placing two pieces of tape 36 inches apart. Your client is going to assume push-up position with a hand on each piece of tape. And basically your right hand is gonna to move towards the left hand and vice versa. The client is gonna be performing alternating touches for 15 seconds. And then from there, you're gonna count the number of times both hands touch the same side. And then you're gonna do three trials. Now for the Davies test, and the depth jump assessment, and uh, well, I guess the gait assessment you can do with most people, but definitely for these two, these are gonna be ones that you're not going to do with too many clients, so just keep that in mind. And next up, we'll be talking about some of the different mobility tests in this CES certification. All right, so first up, we have the ankle mobility or weight-bearing lunge. So the front leg is the leg being tested, and you're kind of in a lunge position with the front foot two inches in front of the wall. So the entire time, the client should try to keep their heels and feet planted. So for a normal mobility here, the front knee would touch the wall. And we're looking at limited mobility if the heel lifts, if the knee doesn't touch, or if there are compensations. And it's a little bit tough to tell in this picture, but Alexis pretty much had normal mobility for this one. Now we're keeping it very surface level for all these mobility tests. If you're actually going to be doing any of these with clients in the real world, you're gonna have to go back and look these up in the book because there are are lots of details that I'm leaving out. Anyway, still talking about ankle mobility, this time we're talking about the big toe. This one can be done seated or standing, and the client is just gonna be literally moving their big toe upwards as much as possible. And you wanna try and keep those other toes stable. So in normal mobility, there'd be no compensation, and the big toe is going to lift over the others. Limited mobility would be obviously the opposite above. We're gonna see some compensation where they can't lift that big toe over the other toes. And Alexis definitely had a little bit of compensation here her other toes are lifting as she's trying to lift this big toe up. Next up, we have the active knee extension test. For this one, you're gonna be lying supine on your back on a table. The client is gonna bring the test knee to 90 degrees, and then the client is going to extend that knee as much as they can. So for a normal mobility, the client is gonna be able to extend their knee straight or come very close. And limited mobility would be, of course, they, they might have some compensation or they just can't come close to that straight knee. And this is a bit of a tough call for Alexis. Her leg is more or less straight, but actually her leg is lifting, her opposite leg is lifting off the table there a little bit so yeah she um she might have some issues actually going on here okay so we do have the active knee flexion test and since it's flexion we know her knee is going to be bending and that joint angle is going to be shrinking so this time she's going to be lying face down on the table and she's going to be flexing that knee as far as tolerable normal mobility no compensation and the client can touch their butt or come close obviously limited mobility would be the opposite of that so on this one she is not even close 
and she does have very tight hip flexors and quadricep muscles so yeah for her it was no surprise that you know she just wasn't going to do very well on this test definitely something for us to work on and again some of these simple little tests actually are pretty useful. So next up, we're gonna be talking about lumbar flexion and extension. And for this one, we're pretty much just going over normal range of motion, and it'll make sense as to why that's the case in a second. But anyways, for flexion, there should be no compensation and the client can touch their toes. For extension, no compensation and the client arches the back enough where their shoulders pass their hips. And yeah, Alexis actually looks pretty good in both of these. She can clearly touch her toes, no problem, no compensation there. And her shoulders are past her hips as she's going back into extension, so she looks pretty good. Next up, we have the modified Thomas test. And an important thing to keep in mind here is the test leg is actually the one that stays on the table, so keep that in mind. A few things that we're looking for here, granted we are looking for more than just this, again I'm keeping all these very simple, we're looking for hip extension and knee flexion. So your hip extension might be restricted if that test thigh lifts off of the table. Your knee flexion might be restricted if the test knee is slightly extended and we don't get to 90 degrees. So again, the test thigh is actually the one that's down here on the table. And we can see that her leg is very much on the table, so it's not lifting up. So that looks good in terms of hip extension. Now for knee flexion, the test knee is slightly extended and not at 90 degrees, that would be restricted. And yeah, I would say she's really not quite at 90 degrees. We already know her hip flexors are tight, so that should be no surprise from that other assessment we did before. So we covered many of the mobility assessments here today, but there are more shown in chapter 10. Don't memorize everything, but look them over before taking your test. I did have a few questions on different mobility assessments during that final exam. And of course, like I said before, I went in and used the search function just to make sure I had those answers right. I actually didn't get that many mobility assessment questions and that's why I didn't include all of them. But again, the search function definitely comes in handy if you need it. It is an open book test. Always remember that. So now we're just going to be diving on into some random things that you should know. I've said it once, I've said it twice, I've said it a million times. Be ready to use the NASM search function. I had questions like, is blank in the lifestyle or occupation portion of the client intake? Also, as an example, they could ask, what degree of range of motion is normal in the passive hip internal rotation assessment? Who the F cares? You're not going to memorize everything like that. Use search when needed. So I had a question about athletic position when I took my exam. And honestly, I really didn't know what it was, so I did have to search this one. But anyways, athletic position is when the knees are comfortably flexed, the shoulders are back, eyes are up, feet are approximately shoulder width apart, and the body mass is balanced over the balls of the feet. The knees should also be over the balls of the feet, and the chest should be over the knees. Kind of looks like this guy is about to spring into action, and that would make sense for an athletic position. I had quite a few questions involving the gastroc and the soleus and the anterior tibialis. So just remember that the gastroc and soleus, they do plantar flexion, where your foot is being planted down towards the ground. And the anterior tibialis, that does dorsiflexion, so the exact opposite motion. And just remember that these guys, these guys oppose each other. Too much eversion or overpronation is a problem and the foot arch could collapse. Strengthen anterior and posterior tibialis. So too much eversion is when the foot kind of collapses inwards, kind of like, like this, pretend that's my foot. Um, but yeah, I did have a few questions about overpronation or essentially this, this eversion right here. And again, to prevent that from happening or to potentially fix it, you want to strengthen anterior and posterior tibialis. Again, I had a few questions on that, a surprising amount actually. So tendinopathy is the term that refers to tendon pain without knowledge of the exact cause. Then you also have tendinitis and tendinosis. Inflammation of a tendon, most commonly from overuse, but also from infection or rheumatic disease. Tendinosis is the chronic version, meaning that it lasts for a longer period of time. And tendinitis is the acute version, meaning that it could be shorter in duration. We have patellofemoral syndrome, and that is abnormal tracking of the patella 
within the femoral trochlea or patellar groove. Then we also have IT band syndrome or runner's knee, and there was a good handful of runner's knee stuff on that final exam, at least in my case there was. Anyways, inflammation or irritation of the IT band occurs because of a lack of flexibility of the TFL, which can cause an increase in tension on the IT band during running. Make sure you have a general idea of what we're talking about here with IT band syndrome, runner's knee. Let's even take that one step further. Frank has IT band syndrome, what should he strengthen in the activate phase? And I'm gonna give you a few different options here. We have A, rectus femoris, B, the TFL, C, the gastroc and the soleus, or D, glute medius. So the best answer to this question would be D, glute medius. Oftentimes, glute medius gets overpowered by the TFL, which kind of like we said before, the TFL is actually causing the problem with the IT band in the first place. So if the TFL takes over, Unfortunately, the glute medius is unable to do its job. So yeah, we'd want to strengthen glute medius to help restore some balance to that TFL and IT band. I've also had a lot of people tell me they got tennis or golfer's elbow questions on their exams. And this is just good stuff to know because when you're actually working in the field, you do see a ton of tennis and golfer's elbow. But anyway, tennis elbow is lateral epicondylitis and that is outside of the elbow pain, kind of like over here on the outside of the elbow. Be careful of over gripping because that unfortunately can make it worse. And for tennis elbow, we're going to want to primarily, there's a few things we would do, but primarily we're gonna to wanna to strengthen the forearm extensors. We also have golfer's elbow, medial epicondylitis, and that is inside of the elbow pain. Lots of things can cause it, obviously golf, but you'll probably see it more from office workers and other types of people. And in this case, you want to primarily strengthen the forearm flexors. Again, that wouldn't be the only thing you would do, but that is one of the main things you would do to help out with golfer's elbow. Remember breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's a good trick to remembering how many vertebrae you have in each of these areas. So you have seven cervical vertebrae and seven, think 7 a.m., that's breakfast. Next, we have the thoracic. You have 12 thoracic vertebrae. Again, that's lunch, so think like 12 p.m. lunch. And then dinner would be the lumbar. You have five lumbar vertebrae. And again, think like 5 p.m. And that would be the lumbar. You also have five fused sacral vertebrae here. And I don't really have a good way to remember that, so you'll just have to kind of remember that. But those ones, again, they're fused together, unlike these other ones in these other areas here. And then of course, at the very bottom, you also have the coccyx. Let's say I have a client who's squatting and leaning too far forward. Let's choose the best cueing advice to give this client. Should I A, tell the client their squat is a mess, B, tell the client to shift the weight back onto the ball of their foot, heels and hips, C, hand the client light weights for increased stability, or D, stop the squat immediately and don't have that client do them anymore. Again, just like usual, there are a few answers here that could potentially make sense, but there is definitely one answer that is better than the rest. I'm gonna give you guys a few seconds to think about that. So the best answer here is to tell the client to shift the weight back onto the ball of their foot, heels, and hips. So if we're looking at that same client that we were just talking about, someone who's squatting and leaning too far forward, Let's talk about what muscles are likely to be overactive and which ones are likely to be underactive. There's a little bit more to think about here. So A, overactive would be the hip flexors and underactive would be the TFL, tensor fascia lata. B, overactive would be the glutes, underactive would be the hamstrings. C, overactive would be the hip flexors and underactive would be the glutes. And then D, overactive would be the glutes and underactive would be the adductors. I'm gonna give you guys a few seconds to think about that. Try to choose the best answer. So if a client is leaning too far forward during their squat, most likely the hip flexors, the muscles on the front side of the legs here, they're gonna be overactive. And most likely the underactive muscles, or at least one of them would be the glutes, the muscles on your butt. And if you think about someone who's leaning too far forward during a squat, it kind of makes sense, right? It's those over tight quad muscles that are kind of pulling them forward. 
and those glutes, they're just not strong enough to pull things backwards. So obviously we didn't cover everything in this CES course. That would take a ton of videos and frankly, I don't think it's necessary. The course is pretty solid. There are some things I would have done differently, but overall they broke everything down reasonably well. This video is just meant to be another tool in your preparation or studying toolbox. If you do want to see my opinion on the course, I do have a video that covers that as well. Anyways, if you guys have any questions or comments, please leave those down below. I will respond to you. And if you haven't already, please consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel because both of those things really do help the channel to grow and that allows me to keep making free content for all of you. Thanks for watching everyone and until next time, stay sort of healthy.